All right. Um, I want, do we have Haskell programmers here? Okay, uh, a few. Okay, so if I make a mistake, please correct me. So like last time I, I wrote type class instead of class, and somebody pointed it out uh, on YouTube. <laughs> okay, so today we are actually starting serious programming in the sense that we've been avoiding this topic so far because the, the topic of recursion um, because recursion really fits with with algebras and today we are going to talk 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 about algebras uh, and and recursion is is like the most useful tool in our arsenal when it comes to decomposing problems okay because recursion is this idea, you have a big problem, right? And um, you want to decompose it into smaller problems. So suppose that there are like sub-problems inside of it. And, um, and you say, if, if you solve these sub-problems, then I know how to combine them, how to combine the solutions and I'll solve the bigger problem, right? And we usually do this and it's like every sub-problem requires a different solution and so on. Uh, but there is this case of, of, of problems in which the sub-problems have exactly the same shape as the original problem. Okay? This is like a miraculous thing, but it happens so much uh, in the kind of problems that we are dealing with. Probably if, if it doesn't happen, then we don't know how to solve the problem, we give up. But if, if, you, if we can do this, then we have this nice recursive kind of solution. We are saying, uh, we are defining something called a recursion step, right? Recursive step, which is, let's assume that somebody gave me the solutions to these sub-problems. The results. I plug these results in, and now the recursive step is, how do I combine them to get the bigger solution, right? And that's all for the recursion step. But once we have the recursion step, we can say, oh, now I know how to solve the smaller problems, right? Because I can decompose them into these little tiny problems and use the same thing, okay? So I know how to do this if somebody gives me these guys, right? And so on. And the hope is that eventually we'll get to a level at which um, some miracle happens and the recursion terminates, right? We'll get to the leaf level of our recursion. And then we stop and then we combine everything, okay? Well, this is a very nice structure. Now, the question is, what does it have to do with algebras, right? You're asking yourself this question. Um, <clears throat> and what is algebra? Uh, so, so normally, when, when speaking categorically, people would say F, F algebra. You, get, you have an endo functor, and uh, you define an F algebra, and blah, 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 right? But, but we know algebra from high school, right? And, and this is things like solving equations and uh, uh, expressions. So let me write an expression, okay, and show you that actually it evol uh, involves recursion. So... 3x plus 4, let's say, okay? That's algebra, right? So algebra consists of two parts. Um, one is, how do you form expressions like these, okay? In different parts of mathematics, you will see kind of different expressions. They have their own syntax and formation rules. The other part of, of algebra is, how do you evaluate this? Because Otherwise, this is like meaningless, right? So there has to be a way of evaluating it to get some results, right? So these two parts. So let's first concentrate on this part. How do you um, form things like this? Or if somebody has provided you with one, how do you analyze it? So the way a programmer would approach this, it would say, he would or she would say this is, um, 
let's split this into smaller things, right? So here's this plus, okay? And it has two things, one on the right, one on the left. Okay, so we'll call this a node, you know, and these are like two children of this node. Okay, now I have simpler problem, okay? I can look at this and say, oh, this guy is also a plus, right? So there is a plus and it has two children, 3x and 4, right? This guy, okay, this is di a little different because this is like multiplication, right? So, so this is a node, let's call it uh, multiplication, and this one has two children, 2 and x squared, okay? And then we continue, okay, what is x squared? Well, it's, it's really x times x, okay? For all intents of purposes, this will be a, a multiplication node of x and x. This guy is a multiplication node of 3 and x. And this guy is... So, so these, these are called leaves of the tree, right? Uh, they, they are terminating the recursion. But you see that what I did? I did recursion, right? I said, this is a bigger problem. If somebody tells me what these mean, then I know how to combine them. Um, so I have some kind of meaning for what plus is. I have some kind of meaning of what times is. I should have some kind of meaning what 2 and 4 mean here. And I have to have some meaning for x, variable x. Right? So. Now, now I can translate this finally into Haskell. This is, this is a data structure. This is a tree. It's a tree data structure. So how would I write it in, in Haskell? I would say, well, I would say data, right? Uh, let's call it ex expression, right? And now I have several ways of constructing expressions. So I will have several constructors. For instance, one way is make a plus node, okay? Okay, so I'll say plus. That's the constructor of the plus node. And what does it take as argument? Hmm, it takes a whole expression, right? Two of them, in fact, okay? So this is a recursive data type. Haskell is fine with recursive data types. Um, there are other ways of forming expressions. This guy, right? So let's, let's call it times. Times also takes two expressions. Then the leaves, okay? The leaves, uh, let's say const, and takes, let's call it a double, okay? These four and two and three, we'll call them double. So double precision floating point numbers although here they are really integers. And then there is variable. And the variable, I will say, this is just a string x, right? So it will be of type string. And this is fine. This will work. And now I can actually write an evaluator for this. Yes? You want or symbols? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Good catch. Right? So this is a sum data type. So this is like our coproduct. We remember coproducts. When you have, uh, I mean, you can form a coproduct either using either data type, or you can just like combine all these constructors, the injectors. Here are like four injections into our coproduct. This, 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 this. You know, they, these are these are functions. Okay, so this is a coproduct. This, of course, is a product because it takes two arguments, right? So it's a coproduct of products, which we call this algebraic data types, right? Things that are formed using products, coproducts, and uh, sometimes exponentials as well. Um, okay, but this is uh, recursive. Can we further split this into the non-recursive part and recursive part? So we would like to do something 
of this type, you know, something that would say, um, I have like an induction step. An induction step in this case would mean uh, these are like the recursive things. So these are like these little piggies here, right? Uh, if somebody provides them to, to me, I can form this data type, right? But what is like the really the skeleton of this, right? So I would have to like put placeholders in here, right? So I will define a data type that is sort of like a recursive, a recursive step for constructing this bigger data type. It would be, let's say, let's call it EXF. F will stand for functor because it will become a functor. And it's kind of important that it's a functor, right? Uh, so it depends on, on this placeholder type. You know, that uh, I don't know yet what it will be. I will put it here, right? So I will say this equals, you know, plus, um, I'll give it the same name. Although if you put it in the same file, they will conflict. But let's, let's on the blackboard, they, they don't. Nobody protests, right? <laughs> so, <coughs> so plus AA, these are the placeholders for expression. Right? And I will have uh, or times AA. Then I have the leaves, and they don't depend on, uh, on X. So I'll just rewrite them. Const double and var, var string. OK? But there is a difference, because Using this data type, I can really construct something that really corresponds to this. You know, I can say, okay, so this is, this is a plus, and I have to give it two arguments, right? So it will be one argument, another argument. This argument is times, uh, and, and times wha of what? Well, it's, it's of... Uh, const two and this node and so on. I can, I can expand this stuff and so on. Uh, this is like a, um, a few lines of code, right? To create a value of this type EX that corresponds to this tree. It's an easy exercise, right? But what, I, what do I do with this? With, with, what, what I can do with this is I have to pick a, a, pick a type for A, OK? And I, the simplest type that I can use it with would be a crazy thing, void, OK? So what is what is EXF of void. How can I form um, terms of this type? I can definitely do a const, right? So, so like a const 5 is a good term of type X void. And, and also var of X is a good term. But I'm stuck, right? So I cannot construct plus because I would have to provide two values of type, type void, right? Void has no values. It's empty, right? So I cannot construct plus or times, and I'm done, right? So at this level, XF of void contains only these terms that look like this, the leaf terms, OK? If I want to construct something more interesting, I can do this trick, xf, and I can put any type in here. So why don't I put xf void, okay? The type that I have just created here, right? So this is like type, well, whatever we call it, right? Type ex1. 
ex1 equals this is type ex2 equals and now i can uh, i can still construct these terms right but i can also say things like plus these terms? It takes double. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the leaves are easy to construct. Yeah. I don't need the void, right? Uh, <coughs> here I can construct finally plus. I can say plus const 5 and var x. And this actually works, OK? I tested it. <coughs> um, but then I'm stuck. I can't go to level 3, right? So if I want to do level 3, I have to do like, you know, 3 times exf of my previous type. Let's, let's write it as ex2, right? Exf of the ex2 will, will give me trees that, that look like this. Something like this, you know, and so on. Okay? <laughs> um, so, in order to write this expression that I started with, I would have to go uh, like four levels, right? Something like that. Maximum. Maximum depth. So the question is, do, do we only get trees of depth 2 or maximum depth 2, right? No, we can still have depth 1 trees, right? Um, but we can now construct deeper trees and so on. So, so we, can, we can have these trees of mixed depth. That the maximum depth is important here, right? Okay. Um, <coughs> So for, for our purposes, we can go up to EX4, and we can implement this stuff. And we are done, OK? Uh, except that the next guy comes and says, uh, I need the depth 5, OK? Can you define a new data structure? And so on. It can go on forever. So the trick is, and uh, to replace it with the with the fixed with with this thing, right? Uh, with fully recursive stuff. So fully recursive stuff, as you can see, replaces the placeholder with the full-blown expression. So it's kind of defines. Okay, let's take this, replace this with itself, what it defines, and we'll get the fully recursive type. Or we could say, uh, well, le let's just create a data type that's a sum of these. So so I have ex1 or ex2 or ex3 or infinitely many. OK? And of course, I can't do this in Haskell. Right? I cannot do the dot, dot, dot here. This is why I use this. OK? But there is a way of making this precise. We can make this precise as a colimit, okay? And uh, David will talk about colimits next time, right? Okay, so I don't have to. <coughs> but this is the idea, okay? So from this functor, okay? I, I haven't really showed you that this is a functor, but it's pretty obvious. Yeah? Uh, so the four thing, if you have x1 or x2 or x3, isn't that not the same as this? Because that's the Okay, okay, so, so the question is like, is this really the same type? Because it has like the leaves, um, the leaves are mul multiple times, right, as, as different things. And yes, this is why we need a code limit, right? <laughs> because in a code limit you have arrows between these things, so you can identify things, right, as you go. Okay, this is sort of a hand-waving argument, so don't really, yeah? Yeah, I guess a really good question. Like, would, for the non-recursive 
like we were talking about XF void versus uh yes i guess yeah there are like two ways of creating a const yes yeah okay so a little bit of cheating right i mean i mean this it, it works in the sense but it produces a little bit more than asked for right okay um <coughs> but at least it produces the stuff that we need and and this is this is this is like purely mo motivational, you know. I wanted to mot motivate you about this. Um, up, okay. No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Got it. Okay. So the next thing I said is, how do you evaluate this stuff? Okay, and you can write an evaluator for this, and this is what normal you, you would do as a normal person, right? But here we are trying for something more interesting. We are trying to extract something abstract out of it. So we know that the evaluation of this will have to be recursive, right? It's like if you evaluate this and you get plus xx, you get two expressions, you will probably say, well, evaluate these expressions first and then add them. Okay, fine, right? But we want to be able to do this recursive step separately. So we, we want to use this form. How do we do this? Well, first of all, when you try to evaluate something like this, you have to decide what is the type of the result that you want. I said double probably makes most sense for everybody, right? Like evaluate this to a double, then, then I would uh, convert this four to a double, let's say. Uh, string, okay, so I would say the variable x, I'll give it a value of two. And I'm, I'm writing a special evaluator that assigns x equals 2, okay? You can write an evaluator for any x, or you can write a function that returns evaluators for any x, fine. So, so these, are, these can be evaluated this way, and then I can do the sum and, and product. But there's nothing in the data structure that says that this is what I have to do, right? I could as well say, well, I'm taking this double, I'm converting it to a string. Okay, so this will be like a string four or so. Uh, this is already a string, fine. Uh, when I do times, I get two strings. I could concatenate them, maybe put a, a, a star in between, right? Concatenate two strings, put a star in between, plus here, fine. So I, ha I can have an evaluator that evaluates this expression to a string. Nobody says it has to be a double could be an int, could be anything really, right? Maybe it wouldn't make much sense for, for a human, right? But maybe there is a civilization for which it makes sense. Okay, so, so the evaluator really takes an expression and produces some, let's say, double or string. Right? Now, how do I construct this evaluator? I construct it by saying, suppose that somebody c evaluated the leaves for me. So they replace the A's here with doubles. They already evaluated the stuff, and it's already double. So I can say, you know, eval that goes from EXF of double. Because they already replaced A's with double, right? They evaluated the stuff. And I only need a function that, given that, evaluates the stuff to double. And I implemented this, uh, eval of <coughs> plus xy. Now x and y are of type double now, right? So I just say x plus y. 
and so on, right? And, and evolve for variable x, I will just say uh, that's just 2, OK? x is equal to 2, and so on, OK? So I can write an evaluator for double. Yeah, I just took, took a shortcut. OK. Um, so, so to summarize, so OK. So this is like a one level evaluation, right? But who's evaluating this x, y for me? Well, there has to be some kind of machine into which I plug this evaluator give it like a full-blown expression like that, and it produces a double result. A machine that does recursion for me. And this machine that does the recursion for me is called a catamorphism. And this is what um, Brendan will be talking about. Okay? So, to summarize quickly, right? The thing is, to define this kind of algebra, I need to define a functor, which is an endofunctor, like this EXF, I have to specify a type to which I want to evaluate. That's called a carrier type. And I have to define a function that goes from the algebra with this carrier to the value of this carrier. These three things. OK? And this is where the abstraction into category theory starts. Don't you want to explain how XF is a functor? EXF is a functor? Yes. Yeah. How do you lift a, a function, right? Yeah. Yeah, so you, uh, you'll just apply it to, to these A's twice. Uh, but you haven't specified F map. But you could, but has No, that's, that's what I'm saying, that how, how, do, how to write F map for it, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I, I could say derive functor. I mean, I trust you. Yeah, <laughs> it will work. I mean, maybe you are thinking that fmap is sort of like a linear thing, and this is like 2. No, it's not linear. It's a, it, it can ap apply to any power. So the arc of what's going on here is, is what Bartosz just said. Uh, we have, we start with some sort of functor. Um, in particular, it's important that it's an endofunctor, but luckily, so that is, it goes from a category to itself. But luckily in Haskell, these are sort of all the functors that we can express using this sort of type class functor. So given an endofunctor, we get a bunch of things. Um, so here's our, our functor. It's called xf. Um, and the point was that given that, you can sort of construct this type of expressions. So you get some data type. Um, and then moreover, with this sort of recursive data type, you get this way of constructing functions out of these recursive data types, uh, which Bartosz said, I'll call catamorphisms, but he uses the word evaluator a lot. OK. So how do we sort of make this idea precise in category theory? Um, we start with a bunch of abstract looking definitions. So um, given a functor f, it's an endofunctor from some category c to c, uh, an f algebra, or just an algebra, if it's clear which functor you're talking about, is two things. It's an object, um, which I'm going to call x. So, and it's an object of C, and it's a morphism from Fx to x. So we call this thing uh, the carrier. This object carries the algebra. And then this thing is the structure map. OK. So. Um, do we have an example on the board? The eval. Eval. Ah, OK. Eval is an example, right? So here's our functor f. Here's our carrier x. Um, so 
And now we have a, functor of, of a morphism from x, fx to x. And what does it do? Well, the definition is only partially given. But we take some expression uh, in these doubles and we, or something of, well, of this type, and we sort of say how to reduce that expression down to a single double. Yep. When you say given endo functor get type, will mm -hmm. an example there be like xf as the endo functor and x yes. as the type? Yes. So the question is, how do we pr uh, produce this recursive data type of expressions? And the way we, we can do this in Haskell is by specifying this ostensibly simpler thing, this functor, and then sort of extracting out this type for free. Um, so the functor is called, well, is f. And we'll see that the type for is a special sort of f algebra. So, yep. What an f algebra is? So, uh, let me give this morphism a name. So, an f algebra is really just this thing. This is all you really need to care about. Um, it's a morphism from f x to x. And we think about f as sort of producing the expressions, this sort of this this recursive structure in some things x, and this algebra, the structure map A, as telling us how to evaluate in some ways, how to reduce them. Uh, it's, it's very abstract, but it'll sort of become clearer today and throughout the, the next few lectures with examples. We'll be spending a couple of lectures on this. Um, OK, so that's what an f algebra is. And we also like to talk about how, when we give a structure, we also like to talk about how they relate to each other. So we talked about categories, and then we talked about functors. And so here we're talking about f-algebras, and we're going to talk about how um, the notion of morphism for f-algebra. There's a question, a uh, couple of questions. So if x is the terminal object, then mm -hmm. it's a unique algebra. Well, the, the algebra asks us to also specify x. Um, so there is a unique algebra on the carrier x. That's true. Does, what does oh, sorry, that on the carrier 1. Hmm? As far as I know, it's not very important. <laughs> um, there's another question back there. Um, when I see F algebra, I think that I, 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 my mind goes to an algebra over a field or over a mm -hmm. Should I be thinking of, is there some analogy here, or is this in some way related to that notion? Um, not tightly, no. Okay. Um, no. Yeah, it's, it's a much more general notion of algebra than just over some sort of the particular field structure or something like that. Okay. But is it in Yeah. Um, let's let's leave that discussion for afterwards. Um, yeah. Great, Alex. Is it one morphism per object? No, no. This is it's just just one thing. So it, it's it's a bit of a weird definition uh, because it seems much smaller than you expect. Like something like a natural transformation is a large. Like there's no coherence going on or whatever. But we'll see how it's useful as we as we go on. So it's just one single object and one single morphism. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. It's just what's written here. Um, okay, so uh, a morphism. So let's uh, let's say an F algebra, and let's just write the pair to make it clear. The morphism is just an F algebra is just those two things, uh, the x and the a. So a morphism, um, sort of. Let's say we have two algebras x, a, and y, b. Um, is again not much, um, is a morphism um, f from x to y in C obeying one condition, such that, um, now what do we have? This algebra here is a map from fx to x, called A. This algebra here is a map from fy to y, called B. And then we're saying a morphism, let's say, let's be a bit more precise, um, of f algebras is a morphism here, so f from x to y. And we want this thing to, morphisms should preserve structure, right? And we don't, as we discussed, we don't have very much structure here. We've just got this map. But somehow this morphism, and this map sort of says how to evaluate expressions. And somehow this morphism should preserve that notion of evaluation. Right? So 
there's sort of one way to fill in this diagram. If we have a little, a little f here, which goes from x to y, and we have this func to f, how do we get something that fills in here? Right. We just apply the func to, to f. Um, and so now we can fill in the square. And a morphism of f algebras is a morphism from x to y such that this square commutes. So what is this saying, or how do we think about this? Well, what we can do is we start with some expression in, in x. Uh, we can evaluate it, and then we can apply f to the evaluation. Or because this is a functor, we can also sort of apply f to each of the sort of terms recursively inside this expression and turn it into an expression in y's, and then evaluate that. And so whether you do the substitution or the evaluation first doesn't matter. You end up with the same y. OK, so a fun fact um, is that uh, <coughs> f algebras and their morphisms form a category. So when I say things form a category, I mean well, there's some objects and there's some morphisms, but a category is extra structure, right? A category also wants a composition rule, wants to know about identities, and then you also have to check the laws, right? It's a question. Composition, identities, laws. Um, there's a question here first. Well, there's a couple of questions. Um, the question is, how does this morphism, how does this idea relate to the idea of lifting? Um, it's, I can see it's reminiscent of a bunch of different things we've been drawing, like the idea of naturality or the idea of a functor or something like that. And so uh, we can take sort of a morphism f, and the functor itself lifts it to this. The way we've been saying lift is usually being we take a morphism in, in some category, and then a functor sort of lifts it to a morphism that could be in another category, but in this case, since the end of functor is the same category. Um, and then we don't actually require any sort of coherence on that. Um, in general, like, we don't often have this sort of structure coming for, for free, this relationship between an object and its image under F uh, in, in general category theory. Uh, it has sort of been showing up a bit in, in Haskell, which can be confusing. Um, but I guess the idea, what I just want to say, is it's just a sort of different concept, and this is it on the nose. Uh, we can talk more about trying to find out like the similarities and differences afterwards. Sorry, uh, just for the notation used mm -hmm. there in that definition, there's an arrow. It almost looks like an arrow going into the tuple x comma a. Ah, uh, sorry. This is uh, this is a morphism of f algebras. Oh, I was okay. sort of. I said that verbally, and then I decided it would be a good idea to write it. But yeah. thanks for, for clarifying it. The question was, what is that little sort of writing there? OK. Um, so hopefully you've been thinking about this while I've been answering questions. Uh, if, so f algebras and their morphisms form a category. Uh, how do we compose, and what are their identities? The answer is that a morphism in this category of f algebras is just a morphism in C with sort of this extra requirement, this extra property. And so we can sort of inherit the composition of the identities and, in fact, the laws from, from C. So we can, uh, so it's possible to work through that and prove that indeed we do have a sort of fairly natural category structure here. OK. Um, I'm going to leave the functor up, so I'm going to get rid of this. OK, so let me give a slightly quicker example to work through than this sort of tree expression thing. It's just this notion of uh, list. Um, so um, an example that I, I want to think about a bit in the next 10 minutes is this idea um, in Haskell. I'm going to write it sort of data f, so this functor f. Um, and it's going to have two constructors. Um, one is going to be called nil, and the other is going to be cons int a. Uh, so this is a type constructor. Uh, as you point, as 
as you pointed out, this should be where we're requiring, we want to work with a functor. Um, so if you want to turn this into a functor, Haskell has this ability to just sort of say, for things of this form, we can sort of turn it into a functor, and it will infer sort of the obvious notion of fmap uh, on it. But I want to be a bit more explicit and sort of uh, also change up the notation. So we'll be in arbitrary category C with, that supports this sort of structure. And I'm talking about a functor f. Uh, and the functor on objects maps an object x to either sort of the co-product of the terminal object and we're going to have this special object called int. Um, and so it can either be a terminal object or an int and another uh, sort of element of x, I guess, if you're thinking setwise. And then given a morphism from x to y, so this is fmap. fmap says I need a, a map from um, 1 plus int x to, I'm going to write it vertically, I guess, 1 plus int y, n times y. Um, so what should this morphism do? Well, we can just sort of, if it's in this point, then it maps here. Um, and it can either, it can, if it's here, we have a pair sort of, of an integer and an x. We can retain the same integer. So this is the identity on, sorry, I'm going to change notation. We can take the identity on 1, or we can take the identity on int times f. Right. Um, so this is, in fact, the sort of f map that this thing will derive. Um, there was a question floating around a moment ago. Is that still <laughs> place? Oh, yeah. Yeah, so, so not every morphism in C is an it's a f algebra morphism. No, only the morphism is exactly of the type fx to x. Oh, sorry, no, uh, sorry, not uh, f algebra morphism. Um, yes, the square must right. commute. So, so can you give an example in like, um, some morphism that fails this square? This square? Hmm. Square? Um, let's, I'll give an, a, a, a base or fails? Fails. Fails. Um, most morphisms will actually just fail. So, uh, but we haven't got many examples of f algebras yeah, right, up. Because that, that square looks very natural. Right. Um, let's see if I can come up with one very quickly. Yeah, exactly. Um, Afterward. Sorry? Afterward. Afterward. Yeah, let's. Let me give you a first examples of things that are algebra morphisms uh, via, via some construction, and then we'll see. We'll talk about examples of things that aren't. Uh, OK. What I want to do is talk about initial algebras. And hmm. actually, examples might have to wait till next time. I'm going to talk about this notion of initial algebra. So we have given a functor, we get a type, right? So the question is, given this, this sort of structure, how do we extract uh, an important type that expresses this sort of notion of recursion out of this data? And we, we spoke last week about how universal constructions are good ways of extracting types. So uh, there's this category here. And in fact, we can talk about uh, when we're in Haskell um, in this world or, or when we're in the category of sets, it turns out that this category always has an initial object. So the way we extract this sort of special type is as the initial algebra, we call it, or initial object in this category of algebras. So let me write out um, what that means in full. So given a functor f, um, an initial algebra for f is, well, it's an algebra, so it's some functor, uh, some map. So I'm going to call the carrier A, because that's the first letter of the alphabet. And I'm going to call the, the structure map in for initial, but also for in. Um, so given f, an initial algebra for f is an algebra such that for all other algebras, or for all algebras, so here's an algebra, A, um, there exists 
a unique, uh, well, a unique f-algebra morphism. So a unique um, f x a to x such that it's actually an f-algebra morphism. So such that f a to a and f x. So here's our initial algebra. Here's my other algebra. Here's f. And being a morphism means this commutes. OK. So from this functor, we can extract out this ta type A, the carrier of the initial algebra. Um, the thing I want to set up for next time is that this, is, this carrier is, in fact, or this, this initial algebra is, in fact, an isomorphism. So I mean, I'm having second thoughts. Is this the best thing to do for me now, or would you prefer? Um, maybe I'll, I'll give two, maybe I'll just give examples then. Um, so <coughs> so there's an algebra, um, so in fact the initial algebra for this functor, um, so the initial algebra for f is what I'm going to call um, list int. It's going to be a list of integers. Yeah, for this for this particular f. Um, and so, how do we understand this? Well, how how is this an algebra? So we'll see once we go through sort of the construction exactly what this is, but how we, we think you should think of it right now is just a list of integers. So it should, could be an empty list, or it could be like, uh, so it could be the empty list, which I'll write like this, or it could be some list sort of 5, 7, 3, and so on. Um, and so you might have a question, how is this an algebra? What is an algebra for this functor? Well, fx, or f of list int, is equal to either 1 or uh, int times list int. And being an algebra means that there's a map back down to the carrier, which is list int. Uh, and so what are these? What's this map? I'm going to say that 1, so to specify a map out of a coproduct, you specify a map out of each factor. So there's a map 1 to list int. Um, and that's just going to pick out a list of integers. And that's going to be the empty list. So I'm going to call that, uh, sorry, I'm, so there's going to be a map that's the empty list. Um, and I'm just going to write a pair. And then what's the other map from int times list int to int, list int? Well, if you're given an integer, let's say n, um, OK, let me write it out here, actually. So here, it's going to map this thing to the empty list. And if I have some pair here, which is sort of an integer and a list, and I'm going to call the list x, um, then what I can do, oh, sorry, yeah, I can concatenate that. The, I can add the integer to the beginning of the list. So there's a new thing which begins n and then is just x through here. And so this is an algebra. Um, another algebra for this functor is uh, the carrier is the integers themselves. So here we have f of int is just 1 plus int times int. And there's a map to int. Um, and what is this going to do? Uh, it's going to take the element here to 0, which is an integer. And it's going to take a pair of integers, mn, to m plus n. So they're simple structures. Um, but what's, what's interesting about this notion of an initial algebra and how we get our evaluator map is that if this is the initial algebra, and this is another algebra, 
then there is a unique map. We get for free a map from this the initial algebra to the carrier of this algebra, right? And, in, and it's given in a way that if we take sort of, so we call this a catamorphism. So I'm going to call this the catamorphism. If this morphism is A, I'm going to call this the catamorphism of A. Um, and it's given in a way also such that this square commutes. Um, so a question then to, to sort of ponder for next time is what should kata, well, what is kata A, right, in this particular case? It's, we've specified this map here, and we for free get this morphism from, that takes a list of integers and returns an integer. Uh, and so it, it turns out that this is a sort of a, a powerful way of specifying morphisms, and we'll find out sort of which morphism we constructed next time. Um, maybe before we close, anyone have questions for the group? I'm sorry, what it, so the, the subscript A, uh -huh. kind of A, A is referring to? A is referring to this particular exactly. uh, yeah. uh, example of an algebra. So what it's, so for every algebra here, we get one of these catamorphisms. Um, and that's by reference to the A that was used over there. But yeah, that but that, that this A is, uh, is instantiated. Maybe I should write like cat, uh, I don't know, alpha. This is cat or alpha. Thank you. OK, question before we? Yeah, is initial algebra just an initial object in the category? Yes, so init this initial algebra, this definition here, is just interpreting what it means to be an initial object in this category over here. Okay, uh, with that, thanks, and we'll see you tomorrow.